You're listening to the free, ad-sponsored re-release of American Elections Wicked Game, a weekly march through every presidential election from 1789 to 2024. To listen to all episodes right now, ad-free, go to IntoHistory.com. Subscribers there enjoy ad-free listening, early access, bonus content, and more from a growing collection of great history podcasts. Start your free trial today at IntoHistory.com. It's January 2nd, 1953, in a congressional office on Capitol Hill in Washington. A senator from Minnesota, Hubert Humphrey, stands nervously outside the office of his colleague, a senator from Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Johnson, or LBJ as he's known, is about to make a big play for a big position, Senate Minority Leader, and LBJ wants Humphrey's support. In a group meeting earlier today, LBJ asked Humphrey to back him, but Humphrey declined telling LBJ he plans to vote for Montana Senator James Murray. Now Humphrey's been summoned back to Johnson's office for a one-on-one. As he knocks on the door, Humphrey braces himself for what many of LBJ's colleagues call the Johnson treatment. Yeah, who is it? Lyndon, it's me, Hubert. Quit standing out there and come on in, Hubert. Now, I know we spoke earlier, Hubert, but I wanted to talk to you alone, in private. Have a seat. As Humphrey sits, Johnson invades his personal space. He slides in close, mere inches from Humphrey's face. Now, let me tell you something, Hubert. You're depending on votes you don't have. How many votes do you think you got for Murray? 13? 17? You better check your numbers. That's too much of a spread. You don't have those senators to begin with. I have personal assurance that all your Murray votes are actually going to me. In fact, that friend of yours, Senator Hunt, the one who was in here with you earlier today, Yes, Lyndon, he's going to be voting for Murray, too. No, he's voting for me. You ought to quit fooling around with people you can't depend on. Now, look, I think you're honest about these matters, Hubert, but you turned me down when I asked for your support, and that was a foolish mistake. You could have been minority whip, but since you bucked me, I took Mike Mansfield instead. Mike Mansfield, a former congressman, is a newly elected senator. Like Senator Murray, he also represents Montana. You'll regret your decision, Hube. LBJ is furious with Humphrey. Johnson is a skillful politician and a Southerner. Johnson knows that to get anything done in Congress, he'll need a respected Midwestern liberal like Humphrey on his side. So Johnson changes his tune from the brash Texan to Southern gentleman. But at least he told me straight. You didn't talk out of both sides of your mouth. When this election's over and I'm the Senate leader, I want you to come back to me and we'll talk about what we're going to do together. I want to work with you and only you. The rest of the bomb throwers are on their own. Bomb Throwers was a pejorative name for liberal Democrats from the North, men LBJ felt were always stirring up trouble. After the meeting, Johnson politely escorted Humphrey out of the room, his lesson in obedience complete. The Democratic caucus voted later that day, and Johnson won the bid for Senate Minority Leader. Later, Humphrey returned to Johnson's office. When he arrived, Johnson asked, Now what do you liberals really want? LBJ became the leader of the Senate Democrats under a fortuitous set of circumstances. The 1952 elections, which put Republican Dwight Eisenhower in the White House, also put the Senate Republicans ahead of the Democrats by one seat. That seat once belonged to Senator Ernest McFarland of Arizona, the Democrats' previous leader. But McFarland had been defeated in his own state by an up-and-coming Republican, a fiery conservative from Phoenix named Barry Goldwater. Did you know you can skip ads and promos like these and listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com? And not only will you be getting the whole series ad-free and bingeable, but you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts also ad-free, like Her Half of History. Because even though Hillary Clinton may not have made history when she ran for president in 2016, there have always been women who seized power, spied for their country, created artistic masterpieces, even escaped slavery. Her half of history is perfect for all those who sat in history class and wondered, what were the women doing all this time? Because the answer is a lot. Get Her Half of History, Wicked Game, and many others ad-free at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. Hey, it's Jeremy from the new show, American Criminal, and I'm popping in to tell you about another great show, Disgraceland. 
Disgraceland is an award-winning podcast that uniquely blends music, pop culture, and true crime with deeply researched storytelling and cinematic sound design. Host Jake Brennan tells the insane stories of musicians getting away with murder and behaving very badly. Stories about Jerry Lee Lewis, The Grateful Dead, Cardi B, Jay-Z, Jane's Addiction, Bruce Springsteen, Wu-Tang Clan, ACDC, and so many more. Now, in 2024, after six years as the most downloaded music podcast in the world, Disgraceland is expanding to include stories from beyond the world of music. Stories of authors, artists, actors, athletes, true icons who possess dangerously compelling rock and roll hearts. New episodes now out on Anthony Bourdain, Andy Warhol, Peter Tosh, and Hunter S. Thompson. Episodes coming soon on Kobe Bryant, Bob Dylan, Basquiat, Jose Cansenko, Van Halen, Bobby Brown, Garth Brooks, Chris Cornell, and more. Full episodes of Disgraceland are released every Tuesday with bonus after-party episodes released every Thursday. Check out Disgraceland on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, or your favorite podcast app. From Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Elections Wicked Game. The 1964 contest proved unconventional from its beginning. The political landscape of the early 60s revealed fault lines of discontent that ran deep in both parties and across the United States as a whole. It was also an election marred by tragedy. On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was killed in Dallas, Texas. Hours later, LBJ was sworn in as President of the United States. The spirit of John Kennedy's presidency cast a long shadow over the 64 presidential election. Following JFK's assassination, there is an appetite for unity, for a sense of shared purpose. And as president, Lyndon Johnson would lift up this sentiment. On the 20th day of January, in 1961, John F. Kennedy told his countrymen that our national work would not be finished in the first thousand days nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But, he said, let us begin today in this moment of new resolve. I would say to all my fellow Americans, let us continue. But for LBJ, the road ahead would be rife with difficulty. The Cold War was in full swing, and the Civil Rights Movement had heightened since the Supreme Court decision Brown v. Board of Education some ten years prior. But to shed the mantle of accidental president and to win the election of 1964, LBJ would have to overcome a conservative movement spearheaded by Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater. Just as there was a yearning for social progress on the political left, there was also a yearning for conservatism on the right. A yearning to break away from the liberal republicanism of President Eisenhower and move the party in a more conservative direction. The country was transforming politically, and for Johnson, the deal-maker extraordinaire, the clock was ticking. At the time he was sworn in, the 1964 election was less than one year away. To win the White House, Johnson would have to comfort a grieving nation while building the political coalition necessary to stop Goldwater. This is episode 45, 1964, Goldwater versus Johnson. A choice, not an echo. The industrial and economic boom immediately following the Second World War continued into the 1950s, and it came with significant social developments. The middle class was growing, and labor had strengthened as organizations like the Teamsters and the United Auto Workers grew. But there were businessmen among the planters and factory owners across the country who had grown dissatisfied with the economic order of the New Deal, which the Republican President Eisenhower had expanded. The many social programs of the day meant higher taxes, and workers unionizing meant increased overhead, which meant that business owners had to borrow in greater and greater amounts to expand and stay afloat. 
The only banks that had the resources to issue the necessary loans were on Wall Street in New York. And for this class of business owners, the economic order of the day was an encroachment on their freedom to own and operate a business as they saw fit. There was also the growing matter of civil rights for black Americans. Since the end of the Civil War, there had been various phases of racial struggle around the country. The infamous separate but equal doctrine, handed down in the 1896 Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson, had established the legal environment in which state and local governments could segregate their citizens based on race. Positive developments, such as the creation of black technical schools at the end of the 19th century and the creation of black business districts like Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, were met with serious and often violent resistance. And even though the United States had fought in the Second World War as part of the Allied powers and had grown into the richest, most powerful country in the world, there was still inequality at home. The GI Bill, designed to provide benefits for those who had served in the war, was unevenly enforced, leaving black Americans largely without the resources to join the burgeoning American middle class. The violence hadn't stopped either. There were riots in cities such as Beaumont, Texas, Detroit, Michigan, Columbia, Tennessee, and there were lynchings, most famously that of the 14-year-old Emmett Till in Mississippi in 1955. Black Americans were largely left behind by the New Deal, and they were kept from the bounty afforded by the Second World War. Isaac Woodard, a black veteran himself and a survivor of police violence in 1946, remarked that Negro veterans that fought in this war don't realize that the real battle has just begun in America. By the early 1960s, through a long campaign of sit-ins, strikes, and boycotts, all put together by local organizers throughout the country, civil rights for Americans of color had grown into a dominant issue. This push for equality was met with resistance and anger from white conservatives from both parties. In the minds of many conservatives, it was the purview of the states, not the federal government, to enforce policies of civil rights and integration. Many conservatives were suspicious, too, of the entire civil rights movement, believing it a Trojan horse for communism. The Communist Party had intervened in civil rights struggles before. Leaders, such as Dr. Martin Luther King, were beginning to speak out against capitalism and in favor of more left-wing economic policies. To many conservatives, the Republican and Democratic leadership had become politically indistinguishable. Neither seemed appealing. Many conservatives felt, as Bob Gaston, president of the Los Angeles County Young Republicans, remarked, that the difference between a liberal Republican and a liberal Democrat is the difference between creeping socialism and galloping socialism. So many conservative Southern Democrats, known as Dixiecrats, felt disenfranchised, and some conservative Republican leaders spotted an opportunity to bring these disaffected Democrats into the Republican fold. The radio host Clarence Pat Mannion was one such Republican. Mannion had organized a campaign ahead of the 1960 presidential contest to unite Americans' conservatives. For Mannion's vision of a conservative movement to be successful, though, Mannion would need to find a leader. He did in Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater. It was a speech delivered by Goldwater in May of 1959 in South Carolina that caught Mannion's attention. In the speech, Goldwater spoke against the federal use of arms to enforce Brown v. Board of Education, an anti-segregation ruling, decrying it as immoral and lawless. South of the Mason-Dixon line, the Republican Party was still associated with the policies of Reconstruction. The post-Civil War period where the Republican-controlled government sought to enfranchise and empower freed black Americans. But Goldwater's forceful words against federal intervention on the issue of segregation offered Southerners an alternative to the old guard Republican Party of the past. One South Carolinian wrote to Goldwater that the Arizonan could pass for a great Southerner any time, any place. Mannion was convinced too. Barry Goldwater was the man to bring conservatives from both parties together. Goldwater cut the image of an all-American man's man. He had a steely look and a sculpted jawline. He had served as a pilot during the Second World War. He was a businessman from the Southwest and enjoyed the outdoors, nature photography, and flying his own personal airplane. He held the U.S. Constitution in high regard. And though he was loyal to the Republican Party, he was nonetheless fiercely independent. He didn't hesitate to speak his mind, either. In 1938, he had published an open letter in the Phoenix Gazette, addressed to then-President Franklin Roosevelt, titled, A Fireside Chat with Mr. Roosevelt. It was a scathing critique of the New Deal. Goldwater lamented that the president had turned over to the racketeering practices of the ill-organized unions, the future of the working man. Witness the chaos they are creating in the eastern cities, Goldwater had written of unions. 
Witness the men thrown out of work, the riots, the bloodshed, and the ill feeling between labor and capital, and then decide for yourself if that plan worked. This had been the sentiment of Goldwater's platform when he ran for Senate in 1952 and replaced longtime Republican leader Ernest McFarland. On the continuation of New Deal policies established by FDR, Goldwater asked Arizonans, Are you willing to surrender more of your liberty? Goldwater was also unafraid to speak out against his own party. In his second run for Senate in 1958, he had called welfare under Eisenhower a dime store New Deal, and he criticized the GOP for only nominally opposing the welfare state, while making little real effort to stop its expansion or to curb what he felt was the pernicious influence of unions. Goldwater's draw was undeniable, and it was due to the clarity of his opposition to the liberalism of FDR and the moderation of Eisenhower. It was laid out clearly in his 1960 book, The Conscience of a Conservative, ghostwritten by L. Brent Bozell and William F. Buckley. The book reads, Man cannot be economically free or even economically efficient if he is enslaved politically. Conversely, man's political freedom is illusory if he is dependent for his economic needs on the state. Conservatism was in ascendance, and if the mission was to put forward a Republican fit for these times, many conservatives believed that Barry Goldwater was the man for the job. It wasn't just Mannion, either. There was William Rusher, publisher for the conservative magazine National Review, Ohio Congressman John Ashbrook, and the powerhouse political consultant F. Clinton White, also known as Cliff. These three conservatives knew each other from their days in the Young Republicans of New York. In July of 1961, Russia had met with White, and they discussed merging Russia's old Young Republican contact list with White's current contacts within the Republican Party. Together, they officially formed the Committee to Draft Goldwater. By early 1963, they had gone public. By the end of 63, they had grown into a powerful organizing force, raising large sums of money and thriving even in the wake of Kennedy's assassination. But the greatest obstacle for the Committee to Draft Goldwater was, ironically, Goldwater himself. He did not want to run, and he was a man who hated being told what to do. In 1960, when Goldwater delivered introductory remarks for Richard Nixon at the Republican National Convention, the crowd had chanted, We want Barry, and he had replied, Well, if you'll shut up, you'll get him. Goldwater wanted to be left alone after Kennedy's assassination. He had respected JFK. He had even looked forward to the idea of potentially running against him and debating him around the country. To Goldwater's thinking, he and Kennedy would have provided a clear contrast, the bookish, modern Democrat from the Northeast going up against the brassy, seat-of-his-pants cowboy from the Southwest. But LBJ was a horse of a different color. Goldwater did not want to run against Johnson, whom he felt would run a dirty, salacious campaign. So if his fellow conservatives wanted Goldwater to run, they would have to convince him. It's December 8, 1963. Men in suits are gathered in the living room of Barry Goldwater's Washington, D.C. apartment. These men are here to plead their case and convince him to seek the Republican nomination for the 1964 presidential election. It's been a long night. There was a time when Goldwater would have done it, but now he's not so sure. He looks to the men. Johnson's got the Democratic nomination tied up, fellas. He's got a bag of dirty tricks, and if it comes down to the two of us, he's going to use them all. I'm talking lies. Innuendo, boys. Lyndon Baines Johnson never cleans the crap from his own boots. Norris Cotton, a Republican from New Hampshire, presses the issue. Yeah, but it's the right time, Barry. Norris, it has been three weeks since Kennedy was shot. The American people don't want three presidents in 14 months. I think our cause is lost. But in Cotton's mind, the stakes couldn't be higher. Either he convinces Goldwater now, or the Republican Party is doomed to irrelevance for the foreseeable future. So Cotton doesn't take no for an answer. He makes a speech. Baron, you know how France was able to pull itself out of the mud after the war? It was de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle had a vision for his country, Barry, just like you. And that vision allowed him to hold out against the Nazis and to let his country pursue its own glory after he pushed them out. France needed de Gaulle then, and America needs you now. The room falls quiet. After a moment, Goldwater breaks the silence. Yeah, well, fellows, I'll sleep on it. As the visitors shuffle out to leave, one man lingers behind. Dennison Kitchell, a lawyer from Arizona and one of Goldwater's closest friends. They share a bottle of whiskey. And after a long silence, Kitchell attempts to pitch Goldwater one more time. Barry, I don't think you can back down. But Goldwater doesn't respond. 
think of all the college students, Barry. There are a lot of young Republicans who are hungry for you to run. Goldwater hears the call of duty. The young Republicans are the future of the party, with strong ideals and youthful vigor. And Goldwater shares their enthusiasm for conservatism. Despite his reservations about Johnson or about the whole project, he does feel a deep loyalty, what he would later call an unbreakable bond. And he knows the future of the Republican Party hangs on his reply. All right, damn it. I'll do it. Goldwater announced his candidacy in January of 1964. The press gathered in front of his home in Arizona, where he nervously stepped out, stood at a lectern and said, I will not change my beliefs to win votes. I will offer a choice, not an echo. He would not be a moderate like Eisenhower. Instead, he would offer a conservative alternative to the Democrats, lower taxes, rolling back the welfare state, and more vigilance in the Cold War. But with only six months before the convention in July, 10 months before the general election in November, and a slew of moderate Republicans throwing their names into the ring, the Goldwater campaign had their work cut out for them. They would have to cut through the political noise and beat the moderates. The race was on. If you're a careful, wicked game listener, you know in the credits I mentioned my friend Professor Greg Jackson and his podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. It's a great show. But one way it can doesn't suck even more is when you listen to it without ads. You can listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game, all episodes of History That Doesn't Suck, and all episodes of many more great history podcasts without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. History That Doesn't Suck is a deeply researched chronological survey of American history from a trained academic who also knows how to tell a story. Plus, in addition to ad-free listening to one of the best American history podcasts out there, you get scores of bonus episodes at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. Tired of ads and promos like these? Want to skip ahead to newer elections? You can listen to all episodes of American Elections Wiki Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. But not only that, you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts, also all ad-free. That includes the American Revolution podcast, a deep and thorough investigation of the times, people, and politics behind America's fight for independence. Also, the battles, because we can't start a new American nation without guns. And the American Revolution podcast tells the story of the revolution from beginning to end, from its origins in the French and Indian War, through the war itself, and on to the founding of the United States. Get American Elections Wicked Game, the American Revolution's podcast, and many others ad-free with bonus content at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. If the Goldwater campaign was to convince the American people of the conservative cause, it would have to start with beating the moderate Republicans. Notable among them was Nelson Rockefeller. Rockefeller had run for president before. He vied for the nomination in 1960. After losing the primaries to Nixon, he decided it would be useful to have held elected office before going into the next race. Seeing it as a springboard to the presidency, Rockefeller ran for and won the governorship of New York, his home state. Now he felt he had the political capital and experience he needed to run for the White House. At his core, Rockefeller was a liberal Republican and an arch-billionaire philanthropist. He had served in the Eisenhower White House, and he was of the opinion that corporations had more responsibilities than just making money, saying that, We must recognize the social responsibilities of corporations, and the corporation must use its ownership of assets to reflect the best interests of the people. Like the rest of the Rockefellers, Nelson had commanded his family's immense fortune in pursuit of what he felt was society's betterment. He had bankrolled black colleges throughout the United States, bailed out civil rights protesters, managed institutions for medical research and training, and restored and renovated cultural sites around the world. And he had used his post with the Eisenhower administration to push for both an expansion of Social Security and the creation of a national health service. Rockefeller believed in government solutions to societal problems. So for conservatives such as Goldwater, Rockefeller's liberal approach was no different from the Democrats and as good as communism. Rockefeller was precisely the echo that Goldwater had promised not to be. Goldwater's support of limited government caused many moderate and liberal-minded Americans to label him as an extremist. But the wound of Kennedy's assassination was still raw. 
LBJ said in his 1964 State of the Union address that John Kennedy was a victim of hate. It was a hate some Americans thought conservatives like Goldwater were stoking. Goldwater's image as an extremist was further solidified when his proposed strategy to deal with communism worldwide became clear. In January of 1964, ahead of the New Hampshire primary, the Miami Herald reported from Concord that Goldwater said he would train, supply, and be inclined to provide air support for the Cuban exiles who would undertake a second invasion of the island. Attempting to succeed where JFK's Bay of Pigs invasion failed. He also made clear the principle of his anti-communist stance. America was being undone by weakness within. Why is NATO crumbling? Why are our allies now willing to do business with our enemies? We are the reason because we have not had a firm, understandable foreign policy in America uh, since the Eisenhower Dulles days. And we're drifting today further and further away from those days of strength that saw us preeminent in the world. The Concord Monitor ran a headline, Goldwater Sets Goals, End Social Security, Hit Castro. Immediately, Goldwater faced an onslaught of criticism from the press, but he didn't soften his message. He told the press at the beginning of his campaign that if it were militarily advantageous, he would break the treaty between the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union, banning the testing of nuclear weapons. To many, Goldwater seemed to possess an itchy trigger finger and a loose tongue in equal measure. It was thought that this combination would sink his campaign. Recalling that Goldwater had just had surgery done on his foot, one supporter told Newsweek that they were glad he had one foot in a cast where he'd have that in his mouth too. Meanwhile, as Goldwater doubled down, Rockefeller tried to overcome his complicated past. In 1962, he had divorced from his first wife, to whom he was married for 31 years. His divorce wasn't the main problem. That was that in May of the following year, he had married another woman, a divorcee with four children, whose custody she surrendered to her ex-husband. The Republican Party had predicted that the remarriage would harm his chances in 1964. Many Americans were suspicious of serial marriages, like one woman who was quoted in Life magazine. What can we tell our young people about this man's immoral living? How many wives did God make Adam? The New Hampshire primary was held on March 10, 1964, and it was a mixed showing for the Goldwater campaign. After canvassing there for weeks, Goldwater came in second, just barely edging out Rockefeller. Goldwater trailed behind Republican powerhouse Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., the ambassador to Vietnam and Nixon's running mate in 1960. It wasn't until the Illinois contest a month later that Goldwater had his first strong electoral finish, taking first place with 62% of the vote. From there, the primary contest went back and forth between Goldwater and Lodge. Then came the Oregon primary in May. It was the first blow and a one-two punch to the moderates. Early polls favored Lodge, placing him as high as 50% leading up to the election on the 15th. But Lodge didn't campaign in the state, and neither did Goldwater, who was in Washington, D.C., in debate on the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Rockefeller spotted an opportunity. Of the top three contenders for the nomination, he had Oregon all to himself. Rockefeller arrived in Oregon and made as many public appearances and shook as many hands as he could. It paid off. He won with almost 33% of the vote, beating out Lodge, who was in second place, and Goldwater, who trailed in third. Lodge had only ever been on the ballot this cycle as a write-in candidate, initially unconcerned with the campaign. He was even out of the country, flying over Vietnam, when he learned over Army radio that he had won New Hampshire. That upset had convinced him to take the prospect of campaigning more seriously. Oregon was the only state where he was actually on the ballot, and Rockefeller beat him. So Lodge gave Rockefeller his delegates and dropped out. Then came California, the knockout punch. Rockefeller was projected to win, but the Golden State would prove a steeper fight than initially thought. There was a media blitz coming from both sides. The Goldwater campaign printed forests worth of leaflets, pamphlets, and copies of Conscience of a Conservative, while the Republican camp doubled down on Goldwater's temperamental and even psychological unfitness for the office of president. But Goldwater came out on top for two reasons. California was a conservative stronghold, home to a highly enthusiastic young Republican base, and Rockefeller's second marriage became a liability with conservatives there. Three days before the California primary, Rockefeller's new wife gave birth. His new son's birth put Rockefeller's divorce back into the public consciousness, costing him valuable campaign opportunities among California's religious community. 
So on June 2, 1964, when California held its Republican primary, Barry Goldwater came in first place with almost 52% of the vote, beating Rockefeller by 3%. Coming out of California with a slew of delegates in tow, the Republican nomination was within Goldwater's grasp. Rockefeller was out. California, a winner-take-all state, was his last chance to take the nomination. He had lost, and by now, with the convention only a month away, it was too late to recover. But the establishment wing of the Republican Party was committed to stopping Goldwater. They felt they needed someone unimpeachable, someone who could please everyone. They believed they found their man in the liberal Republican governor of Pennsylvania, William Scranton. Scranton's name floated through the primary process. He'd only been a write-in candidate thus far, never breaking 5% in any contest until his native Pennsylvania. But for the liberal Republican, Scranton was the man to stop Goldwater from hijacking the party. Like a Rockefeller or a Kennedy, Scranton was part of a political dynasty. It was for his family that the town of Scranton was named. It was his forefathers that had helped forge the Republican Party. So a month later, at the Republican National Convention, at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, the divide between the Scranton camp and the Goldwater camp was stark. Norman Mailer, writing a piece on the convention for Esquire, remarked that Scranton's young supporters were keen, they tended to be smooth, they had a pension for bow ties, and they were the kind to drive Triumphs or Pontiac convertibles, while the Goldwater boys would be borrowing their father's Dodge Dart. Many thought that this was the moderate Republicans' last chance. They had banked on the respectable, pedigreed Scranton to stand as a clear foil to Goldwater. It was all or nothing now. This was a battle for the soul of the Republican Party. So Scranton needed to make a move. It's July 12, 1964, at the Mark Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco, the host city of the 1964 Republican National Convention. It's a Sunday night, in a hotel room that serves currently as the headquarters for the Goldwater campaign. Goldwater, his campaign strategist Cliff White, and a few staffers are gathered together strategizing. Earlier today, the moderate Bill Scranton sent Goldwater a letter challenging him to a debate before the ballot. Scranton had also called the senator's platform a whole crazy quilt collection of absurd and dangerous positions and had accused the Goldwater campaign of regarding the delegates at the convention as chickens whose necks will be wrung at will. So tensions are high in the room as the campaign team decides on a response. An aide speaks up. Senator Goldwater? Yes, what is it? It's possible, maybe, maybe even likely, that Scranton will take this challenge public. Strategist Cliff White agrees. Yeah, he's right, Barry. we got to move quickly. If Scranton takes this to the press tomorrow, we're finished. So what do you suggest, Cliff? White thinks. His genius lies in his extensive list-making. It allows him to quickly collect and disseminate information among his contacts, and it doesn't take long for inspiration to strike. Well, Bill Scranton's normally a cool-headed guy. I suspect he thinks this letter will get us to fly off the handle. But, but if we do, we go into the convention tomorrow looking more like a gang of hotheads than a serious campaign. But Goldwater might be a hothead. He's getting impatient. They need to act fast. We just cut straight to it, Cliff? Well, what if we made it out so that he's the hothead? Goldwater's gaze narrows, takes off his glasses. And how would we do that, Cliff? Well, I'm saying, Barry, that, that we let it backfire. We write a short, dismissive response. Then we attach our statement to his. We make thousands of copies and distribute each pair of statements, his and ours together, to everyone here at the convention. We'll put the letter out first, showing that we're not concerned. Goldwater looks around to his aides. By the looks on their faces, he can tell they're convinced. Goldwater looks back at Cliff White. Well, how quickly can you have this done, Clifton? I can have them printed and distributed in two hours, Barry. If the letter is going to circulate, it's going to be on our terms. The campaign went forward with Cliff White's plan, and it worked. Goldwater's remark simply read, Governor Scranton's letter has been read here with amazement. It has been returned to him. Seeing themselves described by Scranton as chickens caused Goldwater's delegates to double down on their support. And support for Scranton even waned. It was now Scranton, not Goldwater, who looked reckless after so aggressively insulting Goldwater's supporters. Scranton's attempt to provoke the Goldwater campaign into acting rashly, a Hail Mary effort at recovering the primary for moderates, had backfired, just as Cliff White intended. Barry Goldwater won the Republican nomination on the first ballot with 67% of the vote. Scranton came in second with only 16. 
When Goldwater took to the stage, the conservatives in the crowd cheered for minutes at a time. No one could get a word in edgewise. Rockefeller had been given five minutes to speak. He used them to admonish the crowd to reject extremism, and he was viciously booed. The chairman of the convention had to intervene. Richard Nixon made the introductory remarks. He introduced Goldwater as Mr. Conservative, Mr. Republican, and hopefully Nixon said, Mr. President. Many in the press had labeled Goldwater as an extremist. Many moderates and liberals from both parties agreed. Many more would accuse Goldwater of inciting violence over the course of his campaign. But in his acceptance speech at the Republican National Convention, Goldwater took the concept of extremism and turned it on its head. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. The Republican primary was over. The moderates had been defeated in a contest that showed that American conservatism was a serious political movement capable of taking over a party at the presidential level. But now there was a greater test to see if Goldwater and this movement could take on the popular populist president, LBJ. Icebergs, jagged rocks and rocky straits, mutinies, misfortune, and broadside battles. There are more tales of the sea than survivors to tell them. But the podcast Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs is doing a good job, and you can listen to all episodes of that podcast plus many others, including American Elections Wicked Game, without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs is one of my favorites from last year, a podcast about the greatest mishaps, misfortune, and misadventures of the sea. You'll hear stories of corruption, greed, bad intentions, and just plain horrible decision-making that resulted in some of the worst maritime disasters from all over the world. And some of these are more recent than you think. All episodes are ad-free, including bonus content and more, at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. Did you know you can skip ads and promos like these and listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com? And not only will you be getting the whole series ad-free and bingeable, but you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts, also all ad-free, like Wild West Extravaganza, a journey back to the fascinating, tumultuous, and often violent world of the American Old West. From famous outlaws like Billy the Kid and Jesse James, to lawmen like Wyatt Earp and Wild Bill Hickok, to trailblazing pioneers and frontiersmen, Wild West Extravaganza tells the true stories of the real-life characters who shaped this iconic era. So saddle up and discover the true history of the American frontier, the good, the bad, and the ugly, ad-free at IntoHistory.com. The moderate Republicans had underestimated Goldwater. Johnson would not. He would set himself apart from Goldwater's conservatism by pushing a progressive agenda. The challenge of the next half century is whether we have the wisdom to use that wealth to enrich and elevate our national life and to advance the quality of our American civilization. Your imagination and your initiative and your indignation will determine whether we build a society where progress is the servant of our needs or a society where old values and new visions are buried under unbridled growth. For in your time, we have the opportunity to move not only toward the rich society and the powerful society, but upward to the great society. The Great Society was LBJ's War on Poverty. A continuation of JFK's agenda, this suite of government programs aimed to eliminate poverty and racial inequality. But perhaps LBJ's flagship achievement was the Civil Rights Act of 1964, a bill that sought to limit voter suppression, outlaw racial discrimination in public facilities in the workplace, and aim to force desegregation in the South. The bill had been transformational and controversial. A group of conservatives known as the Southern Bloc had resisted the bill when it came before the Senate. 
One Democrat from Georgia pronounced that he and other conservatives would resist it to the bitter end. This Southern bloc had mounted a filibuster lasting 54 days, during which time the bill shuttled between both chambers of Congress until June 19, 1964, when the Civil Rights Act was finally approved by the Senate. Johnson had signed the bill into law on July 2nd, a matter of days before the Republican National Convention. Goldwater opposed the bill, arguing that it was federal overreach and an attempt to legislate morality. Many found Goldwater's position dangerous, though. On July 16, 1964, the same day that Goldwater received the Republican nomination, Dr. Martin Luther King issued a statement, stating that on the urgent issue of civil rights, Senator Goldwater represented a philosophy that was morally indefensible and socially suicidal. His candidacy and philosophy would serve as an umbrella under which extremists of all stripes would stand. Dr. King also expressed concern about Goldwater's stance on foreign policy, especially on the subject of communism, saying that Goldwater had a trigger-happy attitude that could plunge the whole world into the dark abyss of annihilation. For years, the Cold War between the U.S. and the USSR had turned hot in multiple arenas. In the early 1960s, the situation in Vietnam was of particular concern. Since the end of World War II, rebel forces in North Vietnam had been engaged in a struggle for independence from the French. These rebels had organized into the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, or DRV, led by the communist leader Ho Chi Minh. The DRV was recognized by communist states around the world, including the Soviet Union, and it received material support from the People's Republic of China, another communist nation. In response, the U.S. provided aid to the South Vietnamese and French as a part of a policy of communist containment. But in August of 1964, the North Vietnamese appeared to escalate the attack. As part of the effort to contain communism, LBJ had ordered a U.S. warship into the Gulf of Tonkin off the coast of Vietnam. On August 2, 1964, the North Vietnamese attacked the warship, which fired back, killing several North Vietnamese. Two days later, the U.S. military claimed there was a second attack on the ship. LBJ pointed to these two supposedly unprovoked attacks as a cause for the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. This joint congressional Gulf of Tonkin resolution gave President Johnson the ability to deploy conventional military force in Southeast Asia without formal declaration of a war by Congress. In a televised address to the American people, Johnson emphasized that the attacks on the warship were unprovoked. Decades later, declassified documents would reveal that LBJ sent that warship into the Gulf of Tonkin knowing it would likely be attacked. Most modern historians agree that LBJ was looking for political cover to send American troops into Vietnam as part of his efforts to contain communism. And in his televised speech, Johnson hoped to convince the American people that his response to the attacks in the Gulf of Tonkin were proportionate. But Goldwater advocated for a more extreme response, proposing that the U.S. drop a low-yield atomic bomb on Chinese supply lines in North Vietnam. In doing so, Goldwater handed LBJ a political opportunity and the Johnson campaign seized the moment. It's September 7th, 1964. It's Labor Day evening in a sleepy neighborhood in Waukegan, Illinois. An all-American family sits together in their living room. Mom on the couch, brother and sister on the floor, a dog in the corner. Dad sits in his recliner with his feet up. He reads the newspaper and absently watches Monday night at the movies on NBC. Tonight's feature is a rebroadcast of the 1951 film David and Bathsheba with Gregory Peck and Susan Hayward. It's getting late. The movie is nearly done and the kids are up way past their bedtime. So Dad is a little annoyed when the movie stops for another commercial break. On screen, a little girl sits in a patch of daisies, counting petals as she plucks them from a flower. The mom turns to her daughter and smiles. Oh, she looks just like you, Susan. But just then, the mood of the ad shifts. The camera zooms in on the girl's right eye as a robotic voice calls out more ominous numbers. As a mushroom cloud billows into the sky and across the earth, the family hears the voice of President Johnson. These are the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. Then the screen cuts to black. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. 
As the ad ends and David and Bathsheba comes back on, mom and dad look at each other shocked. Their little boy is nervous and turns to them wondering what he just saw. He seems frightened and his sister, who looked just like that girl, is staring straight ahead. Mother is speechless but tries to console them. Father is furious. Hun, put the kids to bed. Put them in bed now. Yes, dear. Father storms into the kitchen, flips through the phone book, and finds the number he's looking for. He picks up the rotary phone and dials a number. An operator picks up on the other end of the line. Thank you for calling the White House. How can I help you? I just witnessed a political advertisement on TV that, in my opinion, should not only be stopped, but the people responsible should be arrested. Um, I'm sorry, sir, what advertisement? My son and daughter were watching. They were watching. I want these people thrown in jail. Um, sir, would you hold, please? The evening of September 7th, the White House switchboard lit up like the explosion in the ad, informally known as Daisy. Americans the country over were shocked and incensed. Republicans and Democrats demanded to know why President Johnson would put out a political ad depicting a little girl being annihilated by an atomic bomb. After being alerted to the flurry of phone calls, President Johnson confronted his assistant, Bill Moyers. Moyers had overseen the production of the ad. Moyers, believing Johnson was angry with him, assured the president Daisy would never run again. But Johnson pulled Moyers aside, leaned in close and discreetly asked, you sure we ought to run it just once? But once was all it took. Johnson's opponent was never explicitly named, but the message was clear. If elected, Barry Goldwater would scorch the earth. Johnson's team pulled the ad immediately, but the next news cycle was dominated by the media showing it in full to report on the controversy. The Goldwater camp rebuked the attack, but in the process they had to acknowledge the ad in the first place. One could argue, therefore, that a night of angry phone calls was a small price to pay for the free publicity. The same day that ad ran, Johnson reiterated the stakes of nuclear war and a Goldwater presidency. Make no mistake, there is no such thing as a conventional nuclear weapon. For 19 peril-filled years, no nation has loosed the atom against another. To do so now is a political decision of the highest order. No president of the United States of America can divest himself of the responsibility for such a decision. This speech and the Daisy ad taken together was the core of Johnson's campaign message. What the country needed in these perilous times was someone to unify it, left and right, labor and capital, and Johnson was the man to do it. By pursuing the growth of all, Johnson said, we advance the welfare of each. While Johnson's Daisy ad made headlines, Goldwater struggled with the media, both in defending himself and in producing his own ads. The Goldwater campaign attempted a public endorsement from Eisenhower in a 30-minute special titled Conversation at Gettysburg. The point was to demonstrate that Goldwater wasn't the hair-trigger extremist that Johnson said he was, but less than 9% of televisions were tuned in when it aired. Meanwhile, Johnson was attempting to secure a much bigger audience. He wasn't interested in a narrow victory. He needed to put his name everywhere he could. He toured New England and the Upper Midwest, and his wife, Lady Bird, embarked on a journey of her own, a train tour of the American South. Johnson campaigned vigorously, and it paid off. When it came time for the general election, Johnson won with 61% of the popular vote, handily beating Goldwater's 38. Johnson was now again President of the United States, but this time elected by an indisputable margin. But Goldwater had remained popular with the base he had accrued in the primary, and that popularity would have far-reaching implications to America's political system. The realignments of America's political parties had largely coincided with the campaigns of transformational candidates. By some historians' accounting, the first party system, featuring the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, was born right alongside our country and lasted until the age of Andrew Jackson, or the second party system, which pit the Democrats against the Whigs. The third party system, which ushered in the Republican Party, was cemented with the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. 
Teddy Roosevelt's accidental presidency in the wake of President McKinley's assassination brought the fourth party system, which saw the growth of the progressive era. Democratic President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's ascendancy began the fifth party system. But in 1964, things changed again. Goldwater's conservative campaign had succeeded in overtaking the GOP. With his commitment to a domestic platform focused squarely on the letter of the Constitution in one hand and a free market in the other, and a foreign policy platform dedicated to stamping out international threats wherever they appeared, the Goldwater campaign had successfully, publicly pushed the Republican Party to the right. As the years moved on, and as LBJ and the Democrats continued to push for civil rights, more and more Southern Democrats, men like Strom Thurmond, would defect to the Republican Party. Some historians assert, therefore, that the 1964 presidential election marks the early beginnings of the Sixth Party System, a political status quo that still exists today in 2020. But if LBJ was a transformational Democrat who ushered in the Sixth Party System, Barry Goldwater was a transformational Republican who was perhaps a signal of what was in store for the future of the Republican Party. But Barry Goldwater only won six states, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and his home state of Arizona. All but that state were in the Deep South, and all of those victories were by margins of 8% or more. The Solid South was no longer bound to the Democratic Party, giving life to a new Southern strategy that would pay dividends to the Republicans for generations to come, starting arguably with the very next presidential contest and a resurgence of a former senator from California named Richard Nixon. This is episode 45 of American Elections Wicked Game, 1964, A Choice, Not an Echo. On the next episode, the election of 1968, against the backdrop of the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement, President Johnson declares his intention not to run in the 1968 contest, leaving the door open for former Vice President Richard Nixon to stage a comeback. But in order to win, Nixon must capture the hearts and minds of a divided electorate and navigate a political system teetering on the brink. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Elections Wicked Game is an airship production. Hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound design by Derek Behrens. Music by Lindsey Graham. Co-executive produced by Stephen Walters in association with Ritual Productions. Written and researched by Dante Flores. Fact-checking by Greg Jackson and C.L. Salazar from the podcast History That Doesn't Suck. At the beginning of the 20th century, few people were interested in adopting children. One woman wanted to change that. Georgia Tan knew that orphaned children just needed a second chance at life with a loving family. The problem was that she wasn't always willing to wait for children to enter the system in the usual ways. So she started stealing them. Hey, I'm Jeremy Schwartz, host of the new true crime history podcast, American Criminal. We take you inside the minds of some of our most notorious felons and outlaws, exploring the dark side to the American dream. In our latest season, how one woman steered the creation of the modern adoption industry and made herself incredibly wealthy in the process. Listen to American Criminal Georgia Tan wherever you get your podcast, or to get early ad-free access to the entire season first, plus hundreds of other ad-free history podcast episodes, subscribe at endohistory.com.